Let's go to the Lord again in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you once again, Lord, humbly, Lord, beseeching you with all these prayer requests. Lord, you heard each and every one of them. Lord, we pray for Kenny's brother, that you'll heal him, Lord, if it's your will. We pray for his father-in-law. Lord, we pray for Michelle's mom, that she'll continue to recover, and for the rest of the Springer relatives that are experiencing COVID right now, that they won't have any serious consequences, Lord. We pray for the preacher, Lord, that you'll give the doctors to wisdom and figure out what's going on with his eyes so they can get that problem taken care of. Lord, we pray for Carolyn's upcoming surgery for her knee, Lord, that the doctor's hands will be steady and the success will be awesome, that she'll be able to walk on that knee and not have any pain, Lord. We pray for all of our children that are facing difficulties in school along with their parents and the teachers, Lord. We pray for their safety. We pray for them to be able to get the knowledge that they need, Lord. We pray for all the shut-ins, Lord, with the poor people that are in the nursing homes, Lord, that haven't been able to see family members in months or any other visitors, Lord. Pray that you'll give them encouragement during this season and all throughout the year, Lord. We pray for um, we pray for our law enforcement, too, Lord. There's, they've come under a lot of scrutiny lately, and they've had unnecessary deaths, Lord. They seem to be very underappreciated and underrecognized. We pray that you give them and their families encouragement, too. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for our missionaries. Lord, we pray for each and every other one of the requests that I've forgotten, Lord, but you know each and every one of them. I ask you to deal with it in your own special way. Lord, we're going to be looking at joy with this message coming up, Lord, and I pray that you'll Help us to understand the importance of embracing the importance of understanding, embracing the great joy that um, Jesus gives us because of the salvation that He brought us. And we thank You for the joy that He brings to the world and the joy that He brings to us as individuals. Lord, be with me now as I bring this message in Jesus' precious name. We pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're in the third week of a series on uh, when emotions rise, but we're looking at the Christmas season this week. And it's apparent in a lot of ways. There's a lot of old traditions that are out there. People put up their trees. They have the, you see a lot of pretty lights out on the houses and things like that. Um, people are buying gifts. They're wrapping gifts, things like that. There's a lot of uh, old traditions that people hold true. There's also some relatively new traditions that people embrace, like ugly sweater contests and uh, people that uh, watch nonstop Hallmark Christmas stories on TV. There's only so many of those you can watch, I think. But anyway... Um, but for a lot of people, uh, the annual traditions um, are, are really important because it gives them a chance to get together with families that they don't get to see very often. Uh, but there's a lot of people that have a struggle to find joy. We're looking at today embracing joy. People struggle to find joy in this Christmas season because of lost ones. And Larry, the first uh, session that we had in this series um, was on, his message was on walking in grief. And it said that God responds to our sorrow with grief and compassion. So even though, even though it can be a difficult time for us, God's there for us. You know, people that have lost loved ones, it makes it difficult for the Christmas season for them. Um, they may have lost a, a family member. They may even have a broken family that's not together, and it makes it difficult during the season. So sometimes they're grieving over the season, but God's there for them. But the joy that we have shouldn't be tied up in outward trappings of the Christmas season. You know, family members return to their homes, you take down the trees, the bills start coming in, so people can lose some of that happiness that they had at the time of Christmas. But our true joy is because of the reason and the purpose behind Christmas, and that joy can last all year round. That's because even when life is hard, God is there. It's a joy that rises out of a life in Christ. So our uh, lesson today is on embracing joy. And the point of this message is we can experience great joy because Jesus saves. And our verses are coming out of uh, Psalm chapter 95 and then Luke chapter 2. So Psalm 95 uh, may have been written. The poet, they, they don't know the author of that. David wrote a lot of the psalm, but not that particular one that they know of. Um, they may have cited the psalms as they were proceeding to and entering into the temple. And it was identifying the Lord. We'll see it in a few minutes in our verses as a rock of our salvation. And the psalmist was calling his audience to joyous worship in this time. And then when we're going to be looking at Luke, Luke recorded Christ's birth and its announcement to the shepherds. And they were there um, to witness the uh, angel's joyous praise. So our first set of verses we're going to be looking at is Psalm 95, verses 1 through 3. And it says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. 
Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. So joy is possible because God is our salvation. In verse 1, the poet began with a wonderful invitation, come, come, come and worship. He wanted to uh, let us sing unto the Lord, make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. And that let us sing usually is, is used in the Old Testament in expressing praise to God. And it was often described um, the way the Israelites felt, the joy they felt because of God's saving acts that he did for them. Make a joyful noise often appeared in the Old Testament to refer to signals for war and cries. You don't think of being joyful, but in that case, back in the Old Testament, a lot of times they were getting real worked up and exuberant, and their joyful noise was getting set and ready to go into battle. But it can also indicate an exuberant response to God. If you think about it, we're in a battle against the world. God gives us victory against that, so we can make a joyful noise because of the victory that he gives us in a lot of the battles that we face every day. So the psalmist further identified the Lord as the rock of our salvation. He's our refuge. He's the protector of all of his people. He's always there for us. And it's in contrast, you know, a lot of the uh, false gods back then were made from stone or wood. Well, stones are hard, but the Lord is firm, never failing, never changing. Um, he's the one true rock. So the apostle also in uh, the New Testament, Apostle Paul identified Christ as a spiritual rock that sustained the Israelites in the wilderness. So not only is he, it's a figurative, you know, he's a rock, he's strong, he's a stalwart, never changing, never, never bending, never breaking. In verse two, the psalmist continued his theme of joyful praise because of the salvation that the Lord has provided for us. He said, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. So they were taught, he was talking then about them coming into the temple to worship in Jerusalem. And, you know, the Lord's presence can't be limited to any specific locale. He's anywhere and everywhere. But in this particular case, he had chosen a definite place for his people to come and gather and worship. And part of the reason he did that, because at the, back in the time, there was an abundance of pagan uh, worship sites around the land. They often call them the high places. And the Lord had a specified place for his people to come to worship him. Because a lot of times it would be very easy for the Christians to give in, or for the Israelites to give in to idolatry. If they didn't have that designated place to worship, you'd see all these other places around you. They'd be very easy to fall in, into that with other people. But they had this one specific place where they could go and worship the Lord. Um, he said, let us come before. That means to me. They wanted to come. Um, genuine worship involves meeting the Lord. You can't genuinely worship him unless you come to him. You have to meet him. You have to be with him. You have to enter into a relationship with him. So... Um, and then he once again said, make a joyful noise. So he's basically repeating what he said in verse 1 for emphasis, making a joyful noise unto the Lord. So in verse 3, the psalmist summarized the reason for why they had all this exuberant praise. It said, because the Lord is a great God. You know, great can refer either to his, he is great. He's great in power. He's great in importance. He's almighty. He's all-knowing. He knows everything, anything and everything. And he said he's a great king above all gods. So even though a king led the nations of Israel and Judah for hundreds of years, their faith really included the confession that God was their ultimate king. Um, the king derived their authority from the Lord as his anointed. And because of that, all, you know, he was a great king above all gods. So he was the king of, of, over the kings, but he was also above all the other gods, a great king above any of the other false gods they had back at that time. And um, it stresses, you know, that says that the Lord is a great God. That stresses his might. It stresses his strength. The Lord's power is mighty, almighty, in contrast to the idols. So that gave the people great reason to have joyful worship and praise for him. And in the New Testament, Romans, Paul referred to the good news of the gospel as the power of God unto salvation. And then uh, we're going to go to our next set of verses, which shifts over to Luke. And we're in Luke chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. <coughs> Pardon me. And it said, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, 
and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. <clears throat> so Jesus' birth was to bring us salvation. That was why he came to earth. In verse 4, in submission to Caesar's uh, Augustus's decree, Joseph and Mary, <clears throat> pardon me, had journeyed to Bethlehem. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> okay. Um, the Roman government periodically took census back then um, to establish official lists used um, for taxing the population. So in conformity to the Jewish custom, the uh, government sent the Jews back to their ancestral homes to register. And uh, Joseph and Mary that were in, uh, living in Nazareth traveled to Bethlehem, which was the hometown of King David, David because they'd been traced back to his lineage. They came from his family line. And the city's name, Bethlehem, generally had been understood to mean house of bread in the Hebrew language. So it's kind of ironic and appropriate when you think of it. Um, Jesus, who is the bread of life, was born in the village of Bethlehem, which was a house of bread. So um, while Joseph and Mary apparently traveled to Bethlehem in obedience to the Roman emperor's decree so that they could be counted to be taxed, their journey, more importantly, was done to fulfill prophecy. God had a plan. The divine king had a plan for his son's birth to occur in Bethlehem. In uh, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says, But thou, Bethlehem, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. So all of this was all orchestrated because of a plan that God had. So in verse 5, Joseph and Mary traveled the 90 miles to Bethlehem to be taxed. And back then, the way they were traveling, it would have taken four to seven days. And that's a long trip for somebody that was well along with child, for anybody, but much less somebody that was quite pregnant. Um, Terry and I were watching a thing on TV that's about the Trail of Tears. I don't know if y'all know about the Cherokees and how they got sent over to Oklahoma, but they, you know that, that was a terrible, 800 miles those people walked. A lot of those women were pregnant at the time, and a lot of them lost their kids. And it was just a terrible journey. And I, you know, it's not even for the same purpose at all as this, but you just think, you know, there's a lot of things people go through. That, was, that had to be a difficult trip for Mary and Joseph, but, but they did it. And, it was, and because it was orchestrated by God, it, it was part of his will. Um, but why did Mary accompany Joseph in the first place? She didn't even really have to. Women typically weren't required, um, but Luke did it. Uh, Luke didn't really give us an explanation. Um, Maybe she was afraid to be by herself so close to being delivered. Maybe he didn't want her to be by herself. Maybe she was afraid to be alone. But for whatever reason, we know why. It was because of God's plan that she went. So, But ultimately, God was in control of bringing it about to happen as it did. So Luke described Mary not only as pregnant, but also as a spouse to Joseph. Um, they were already married. Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 tells us that uh, Joseph took Mary as his wife after the angel had appeared to him in a dream. He had told, the angel had told him in uh, verse 23, Joseph, that Mary would conceive uh, and that he should take Mary as your wife. In verse 20, he said, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And he told him in 23 that Mary was going to conceive a child. Um, and he told, Mary to, he told him to marry her. So um, otherwise, Mary wouldn't have traveled with Joseph at all if they weren't married at that time. That wouldn't have been socially acceptable. Um, but anyway, anyway um, although Mary and Joseph were married, they hadn't yet physically consummated their marriage. Uh, verse 25 in Matthew tells us that um, they didn't, that he did not, he knew her not until after the child's birth. So they hadn't consummated the marriage till after birth. So this basically um, reinforces the fact that Jesus not only was conceived of the Holy Spirit, but he was also born of a virgin Mary. So I've got to tell you all a story about when my daughter, she was either in third or fourth grade, we were in church when, around Christmas time, and the, the preacher was talking about the Immaculate Conception. And being a nurse, we all we watched medical shows and animal shows and documentaries and stuff like that. So my kids saw all kinds of stuff on TV. So my daughter leaned over to me in, in church, and she said, when he was talking about the Immaculate Conception, she said, "Is that the same thing as artificial insemination?" <laughs> <laughs> It's like, uh, not quite. <laughs> it was really more like in vitro fertilization, but they didn't have that back then. So, and I didn't go into that with her either. But anyway, 
I said it was a special gift that God gave Mary. So anyway, we left it at that. <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes, right? <laughs> In verse 6, it says, um, while they were there, uh, Jesus was born. It says the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Verse 7 says, Mary brought forth her firstborn son. Firstborn, that, that oh, let us know that she was going to have Joseph and Mary later on had other children. But Jesus was the only one that was born through that miraculous birth. The others were born between them as husband and wife. And then after giving birth to Jesus, Mary wrapped him in swaddling clothes. That's a long piece of linen that they used in the ancient world to um, not only wrap babies, they'd use it for broken limbs, um, they'd use it for embalming, uh, for wrapping up the, the ones that had passed. Um, but after their swaddling her newborn baby, Mary placed him in a manger. Jesus' first crib was basically a feeding trough for animals. So, because there was no room in the, in the inn for them. So, Luke accurately was portraying the Son of God's coming as a humble servant. The King of Heaven emptied himself and submitted himself to the lowliest conditions of birth to bring us salvation. And that, because of that, with our, and with our faith in him, we should rejoice. This is about embracing joy. You know, the, they were telling them back in Psalm to, to sing a joyful noise. We should be joyous. Um, 1 Peter 1.8 says, Rejoice with un joy unspeakable and full of glory because of what God has done for us. So we should be the same way. So um, our next set of verses is verses 8 through 14 in Luke chapter 2. And it said, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you that ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Mm. And suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. Oh, what a wonderful set of verses. What a wonderful, wonderful feeling that gives you. Mm. So, um, God chose the shepherds to be among the first to hear about, the to be the recipients of the good news of Jesus' birth. Um, you know, God cares for everybody, each and everybody, but a lot of times he cares, especially for those that society generally rejects. You know, the shepherds were considered lowly back then. Um, and the people who feel rejected are often much more open to embrace the joy of the gospel. Um, they feel alone, forgotten. You know, a lot of times in the other countries, we have a hard time sometimes in our country getting people to understand and embrace the joy that God can give us. We're such a spoiled society. We have everything. You know, people that have nothing, when they have the Lord, they have everything. And that's the Lord's everything we need. But a lot of people don't see that because of all the stuff that they have, you know, they don't see the importance of that. So anyway, they came, the angels came to the shepherds so that they could see that first and be one of the first ones to understand the exciting news that was coming to be. So in verse nine, it says an angel of the Lord stood in the shepherd's presence. Angels were messengers, basically is what it means in the uh, translation. The God created angels for the purposes of worshiping and serving him. And um, it said, fear not, when they said that, um, you know, the angels, how, how would you feel if angels came up, you know, over you and you had the glory of the Lord shine around about you? Fear not. Well, last week's lesson that Greg did was about fear. You know, fear can, can cripple people. Fear can be very beneficial, too. Um, it can heighten your sense of awareness, you know, it can make you cautious and things like that. But Fear can also be um, numbing, but uh, last week's lesson was shaking off fear, and it said God is our defender no matter what we face. So God's always there with us. We have no reason to fear. Fear not. Um, so fear is not a bad thing in the, in the right place, in the right circumstances. There's um, other verses, you know, in the Bible. Back in Luke, uh, the angel told Zechariah, fear not that Elizabeth was going to have a son. 
And in Luke 127, the angel told Mary, fear not, thou hast found favor with God. There was a lot of times where they were saying, fear not. When you tell these people these incredibly amazing news, you know, sometimes you have reason to fear with it. They told them, fear not. God is with them, fear not. So, um, they were sore afraid. They were afraid. That's why the angel said to them, fear not. So at his son's birth, God gave them, uh, the angels, the task of announcing and celebrating that birth. And the shepherds, the way they reacted in terror is not surprising, considering, um, like was said, the angels coming down in the glory of the Lord. That would be quite a sight to see. In verse 10, um, and the angels said, fear not. In other words, they wanted them to stop being afraid, uh, because I bring you good tidings of great joy. The great joy, you know, Christian joy is a state of well-being, and it's a delight that comes from knowing and serving God. We have that joy because of what God's done for us. Um, and it can be experienced by all people. That joy is not just for me. It's not just for you. That joy is out there for anybody that wants it. Anybody and everybody can share in that joy. Um, all they have to do is be in a right relationship with God through His Son. His Son, by His blood, obtained redemption from sin. That salvation is offered freely to all people. Anybody, everybody, all people who trust Jesus as Christ and Lord, as Lord and Savior. So, here back then in that most unlikely place in the stable, in the to the most unlikely recipients, you had Joseph and Mary, young, non, not, fam not famous, well-to-do, anything like that, you know, lowly people that you wouldn't think of anything at the time. God provided the world with a reason to rejoice. So in verse 11, the angel summarized the joyous good news. He said, a savior had been born that very day in the city of David, which was a reference to Bethlehem, David's hometown. And that savior is Christ the Lord, so the Lord showed it was a, uh, showed His sovereignty. He was sovereign over would be sovereign over all. And Christ means anointed one. So He was the anointed one that was going to be over all. In verse 12, the angel showed them a sign that they could identify the baby. He said that they would be able to find the baby because he would be lying in a manger. And in verse 13, suddenly, uh, with the angel was a multitude of the heavenly hosts. There was a huge angelic choir that appeared with the angel that had spoken to the shepherds. And the Greek uh, word translated host literally means army. So it's basically a military term. So the, the heavenly host refers to God's army. Um, they were at his command. And there was consisting here of angels. His angels were his army, his host. And they were there praising God. So um, they did so because God had acted in the fullness of time to bring about his redemptive purpose. That's why they were praising him. The child who had been born in Bethlehem was going to be savior of the world. And in his incarnation, Jesus would most fully express God's revelation of himself as redeeming love. In verse 14, and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. So people can't produce peace on earth merely by showing goodwill to one another. Uh, you know, we can't be... Uh, gen we can't be genuinely at peace with each other until we're at peace with God and we become recipients of his good pleasure or favor when we place our faith in his son. Uh, you think of joy and you think of happiness. Well, happiness and joy are the same things. Happiness happens to us. It's based on our outward circumstances. You know, we desire to be happy. We can seek it, but happiness isn't a choice we make. It's based on things around us. But joy, on the other hand, is a purposefully made choice. And um, joy, the good news of the job, gospel, elicits joy because of that great news. Um, joy doesn't enter into something, it doesn't um, center around something that we earn um, or in the material things that we possess. It involves an inward sense of contentment and comfort that comes from a right relationship with God. It's an attitude of the heart and the spirit. And it's um, something, it's, it's, you know, God is there. God saves us from our troubles. God saves us from our sins. God saves us from ourselves. You know, that's his gift. It's God's gift to us. So when we do that, we, we should embrace all that with joy. You know, we should have a lot of joy in our hearts. Does joy mean you're always excitedly jumping up and down? No, but that joy is that contentment you have in your heart from knowing 
that your Lord and Savior is there for you, your rock, your salvation. He's always there. Um, the, the, I don't, most of you probably have watched um, Charlie Brown's Christmas story, but um, for unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That Charlie Brown is what Christmas is all about. Joy. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive our King. What a wonderful time of year. But that joy doesn't have to stop after Christmas stops this week. That joy can continue all year long. We have that joy in Jesus Christ and in our Lord. He's always there for us, always has been, always will be. We just need to remember that. Circumstances can be hard. We can have grief. We can have fear. But we should embrace joy because the Lord is always there. Any comments or closing remarks? All right, let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the precious gift of your son's birth. Lord, what a wonderful gift that made our salvation possible. Lord, please don't let us take that for granted. Lord, Lord let us be truly joyful in knowing what that gift is. And help us to share that gift with other people that may not know it, Lord. We need to share that wonderful news with others about the, the wonderful gift that you gave to us. Be with us this week and throughout the rest of the season, Lord, that we can uh, share with others what you mean to us. And be with our families, keep them safe. Lord, be with our country. Be with the preacher and his family. Be with the message to come soon uh, at the next uh, session, Lord. Be with our whole world, Lord, I pray, Lord, that we can have a resurgence back to you, Lord. We need you, Lord, so much in our lives. In Jesus' holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Amen.